Hi, this is Michael. Before we continue with part three of this message that I filmed up on the mountain about how to win this battle in spiritual warfare, I want you to be encouraged even more. I want you to see how real the principles are that I'm speaking to you about in God's Word. And I want you to know that I'm still practicing what I preach. These things I'm sharing with you are not things that I used to do years ago. These are things that with God's help, I continue to walk in um, as needed as I continue to walk and face a battle. And the devil has provided another wonderful opportunity to show how real he is and to show his hand that shortly after I made this recording, the devil was pleased and God again was pleased to allow him to come in and attack me. And it was not through a person It was through a spiritual fog, a real heaviness. This is probably one of the most transparent series of recordings and most dangerous recordings I've made to the kingdom of hell and to the kingdom of Satan, uh, without a doubt. And so in response to that, naturally, he attacks me. And so what's interesting is, is you're going to hear me even mention, it's a bit prophetic, you'll hear me mention the possibility of devil attacking me even today in this message. Take a listen to this clip. When you're at peace, you're always ready for anything that comes, okay? Like, for example, if some terrible thing happened to me today, if the devil wants to be um, uh, coming at me today with anything, my feet are ready, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, within a few hours of me making this recording, a real spiritual oppression settled in upon me. I'm not doing anything to be disobedient. I'm not living in any known sin. I'm not harboring any unforgiveness. I'm not struggling with lusts. I haven't been being disobedient to God. Now, on the contrary, I'm right in the sweet spot. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ of God's will for my life, being directed and guided by the Spirit, You'll know this from listening to this message. This came from God and not from me. And then here comes the devil again with an all-out war against me to try to stop me from sharing this recording. And there was just a real spiritual fog that settled in over my heart. It was a weightiness, and I recognized exactly who it was coming from, and what it was. Thanks be to God. I just want you to know that I still live these principles that I'm sharing with you. I still do have spiritual battles. In fact, you'll hear me testify to why I have reason to be even under more attack today than I did 19 years ago or even 10 years ago, or five years ago. And I just want you to see that these principles work. You know, the devil was trying to really discourage me and send some flaming arrows of doubt into my mind about even sharing these messages uh, to try to stop me from sharing this with you. And that's what I want you to know. This is valuable stuff in the kingdom of God. This is really helpful spiritual bread, and the devil has put his signature on it. You see, behind the scenes, I made a pact against the devil years ago when he destroyed my life I said that's okay you can destroy my life with God's permission but I'm gonna rat you out I'm gonna tell everybody what you did and I'm gonna tell them exactly how you did it you lying thieving cheating stealing killing murderer father of all lies I told the devil that I'm not afraid of the devil anymore. I used to be. Now I know the devil and all of his angels in hell can't do anything to me that Father won't allow. That is the truth. And anything that they're able to do to touch me only serves to make me more like Jesus Christ, to make me more humble, to make me dependent upon him more. For nearly 48 hours, this funk came upon me. And I began to fight it and fight it just through humbling myself before the Lord and asking him, Lord Jesus Christ, do not lead me into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Friend, I want you to add that as part of the principle of learning how to have victory in spiritual warfare. Pray daily that the Lord would not lead you into temptation, but deliver you from evil. This is a principle that John Bunyan learned through years of suffering in spiritual warfare. But I want to give praise to God Because as I waited patiently and put into practice, my friend, the exact principles that you're getting ready to hear in this message, indeed, within 48 hours, the fog lifted. God was pleased to allow the clouds to part and the sun of the Lord Jesus Christ again began to shine and rise in my heart. 
in fullness. So I share this message with you today with excitement, and I just want you to know it's been approved both in the kingdom of heaven and both here in the kingdom of the devil, that it is a message he does not want you to hear, and it's the words of God he doesn't want you to follow. Listen to this message multiple times and consider taking notes so you can get these principles in your heart and you can begin to walk in them and be patient. It takes time to learn these things. May God bless you as you listen. Okay, from here, let me try to wrap this message up with the actual biblical principles, saving the best for the last, God's words, not mine. I've testified to you about how real spiritual warfare has been in my life, how important it is. Um, the different aspects of it, God's purposes for it. Now I want to show you directly from God's word how you are to respond. Now this is not exhaustive. There's much more God's word says on this, but these are the main points uh, that I found and followed and that you can too, okay? How do we respond? Number one, you have to stay alert. You have to recognize that you're in a battle, I found an, an illustration is a soldier who finds himself in war, but the battle has stopped for a short time, and he's walking through a field with his gun down. Maybe the cartridge has been pulled out, and all of a sudden, he's surrounded by enemy fire, and it's too late. He had put his gun down. He was at ease. Stay alert. Recognize that every day is a potential for the devil to come at you. Okay, you do need to stay alert. This is something the Bible commands. Even though God is in charge, you have a responsibility to respond to the truth and to his ways. And 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10 tells us to be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. How? By standing firm in the faith. It's, it's, it, you could say, Jesus, Peter is saying, resist him by standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. I am your brother from around the world and I've just told you about many things that I myself have suffered that you are suffering. Maybe not the exact circumstances, but I'm sure you were able to identify with some of the things I've told you either in this recording or in the recording I made in part one about this. Be encouraged by that. Be encouraged that, wow, Michael, Brother Michael went through the same thing or, you know, uh, Brother Michael had that same thought and, and he got through it. Be encouraged, okay? Be alert, be encouraged. I'm telling you it's real. Verse 10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. My brother, would anybody, if you've been listening to more than say a dozen of my videos, would anybody need to convince you that God has indeed made me strong, firm, and steadfast? not because I'm special. These words were written 2,000 some odd years before I was born. These words were true for hundreds of thousands of people that lived before me. And they're true for you if you possess them and walk in them by faith, believing that what God's word says is real. It's not just some anecdote like we get from the world. This is real, okay? I'm walking in it. God has indeed, after I suffered a little while, made me strong, firm, and steadfast such that I now thank God for the devil. I thank him for it. Number two, put on the full armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. This is a great passage to really unpack and meditate on. I cannot pull the whole thing apart now. You could do in a whole separate message on this, okay? It's not rocket science. Stay childlike. You don't need to go looking up Greek and Hebrew words or watching a bunch of sermons on this. Just be, obey as a child. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, okay? The devil's coming into your life with schemes in order for you to survive it and not be one of those who's laying out on the battlefield dead you have to put on the full armor of God. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly 
realms. Those are the realms that you and I cannot see. They're spiritual, okay? I probably have mentioned it somewhere before in the book. I have a child who for a season in their life, God opened their spiritual eyes and they were able to see demons and even a few angels. It was extraordinary to hear my child describe to me what these demons look like, but more importantly, what they were doing. And you know what they were doing? They stand around and they watch you. They stand around and they stare at you. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. Okay? And they stand around and they stare at you and observe your behavior and they watch you. They are literally, as that devil, the prowling lion looking for someone to devour. And it's a spiritual devouring. They're listening to the words that come off of your mouth. They're, li- they're watching what you're watching on YouTube. They're watching how you speak to your spouse. They're watching how you spend your money, what you do when nobody's watching. They are owning you. They're taking an inventory of you. They are accusing you. They are out to trip you up. They are out to take you out. You have to stay alert, okay? Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if, when the day of evil comes, You may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand, God, I can't do anymore. After you've done everything you can to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Matthew 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. Jesus Christ, the word became flesh. Truth, the love of the truth will keep you safe. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Breastplate of righteousness. You have a piece of armor God is pleased to give you called the breastplate of righteousness. Invisibly speaking, it's God's way of placing his hand in front of any of the arrows that the devil wants to send into your heart. When you take it off by loving money, by making unwise, foolish, evil choices, by participating with some alcoholism, by looking at pornography, by harboring a little unforgiveness towards yourself or someone else, any of these things, disobedience in any area, You are taking off, effectively removing this breastplate of righteousness, and here come the arrows. Thop, 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 thop. Now, what good thing does this have in mind? If you have taken off by disobedience, which the Bible says all men have been bound over to disobedience so God can have mercy on them, all right? When you know this and you fear God, you're not to make excuses and keep walking in disobedience. But when you do... God will be pleased to allow the devil to touch you in some really horrible ways. This will humble you. This will break you. It will cause you to come to a place, perhaps, of godly sorrow that leads to repentance. So you can see how even when you've taken off your breastplate of righteousness, I've done it, and all the arrows come in. I tell you the truth, when I was involved in sexual sin at one point, and I was fighting it, and I knew I was not supposed to be doing it, I had my first ever, what I would describe as a panic attack. It was so horrible and so real. I could see why people want to run and take Xanax. If I hadn't known the Father and trusted Him and I hadn't had eyes to see that I was being disobedient, what a lot of people call mental illness is simply spiritual attack. And they don't realize it. They want to go medicate it. Well, where in the world would you medicate it 100 years ago, friend? Who would you run to with all these torments and thoughts and panics that some magic pill is going to help you out with now? No, that is trusting in a pill that is trying to avoid the discipline that God is bringing into your life. Probably nine out of 10 times, people that have all these spiritual torments and fears and thoughts and darkness and things they can't, and they want to run to a pill. Good luck. See how that works out for you and call me in five years. I can tell you exactly how that ends. I've heard from enough people around the world. It's a prison. It's an idol. When indeed what's happening is you've taken off your breastplate of righteousness. You have some area in your life that is known, willful, stubborn disobedience. And God is pleased to allow the devil to enter. 
thop, 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 right in your heart. He's trying to turn you away from it. Praise God. I had to pull off on the side of the road. I was in such a panic. I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. I literally called a friend of mine and I said, brother, I need for you to pray for me right now. I am in trouble. Now, this is hilarious to me looking back on it, how dramatic it was and how real it was. And I would never do something like that now. I know exactly how to go to Abba and get all the help I need for anything I need. But, oh my goodness, I was growing as a Christian and I was being disobedient in the face of so much goodness God had done in my life. So thank God, instead of me complaining about the torment and the panicky thoughts and instead of me taking somebody's advice, you know, you should go take some Xanax for that, Michael. That'll take care of that for you. Instead of killing The Holy Spirit who's trying to grieve me, he's grieving, he's trying to grieve me. Instead of avoiding the discipline, I went to Abba and I said, Lord, I I have messed up. This cannot be from you. I have no peace, no joy, no rest. It's gone. You're right, Michael. Turn from your sin, son. I'm standing right here. Come back, set it down. Wipe the poop off. Come back into relationship with me. Okay, this is what Father wants us to do and this is another great reason for spiritual attack stand firm then verse 14 with the belt of truth buckled around your waist the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace when you're at peace you're always ready for anything that comes okay like for example if some terrible thing happened to me today if the devil wants to be um, uh, coming at me today with anything My feet are ready fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. I have peace with God right now. I have peace with Jesus Christ through his blood, through obedience to his word. So whatever the devil brings at me, and guys, he brings all kinds of stuff to me. You might imagine if you think you're experiencing spiritual warfare, how much more if you were able to become a productive member of the kingdom of God, if you're not already, And instead of you just worrying about how to get your own self out of the spiritual wheelchair, you're actually out trying to help other people get out. How much more does the devil go after that person than he does person who's still sitting in the wheelchair themselves? When you have peace with God, you will have readiness with the devil's attacks. They still will come in. They still will have feeling to them. They will still hurt. They will still grab your attention. But then you have this peace with God that gives you the readiness, you're prepared. You have your breastplate of righteousness on, you have the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now let's move on to verse 16. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This to me is the climax. It's the the foundation, it's the most important, it's the centerpiece of handling spiritual warfare. You have to believe God. No matter what your circumstances say or no matter how things feel, you have got to be able to take up the shield of faith that says things like, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That if God is for me, who can be against me? That no one who trusts in him will ever be put to shame. You have to be able to know that the day will come And you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will never be put to shame. You have to have the faith to grab Psalm 91.1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High God will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You have to take up the faith. You have to exercise your faith. You have to pound yourself with scriptures about it. And I'll talk a little bit more than that. But... This scripture alone, God showed me so many times when I would go through the battle. So many times. Because the battle is to create doubt. The whole point of spiritual battle is to get you to distrust God and to take some action apart from Him. The thought comes in, and the thought alone is not bad. Okay? It's when you take an action on that thought or you do not act. For example, if God is wanting you to move forward and the devil sends a thought to freeze you in fear. This, this is how spiritual works. He's, he's trying to get you to act independent of God's will. If God says go, devil wants you to stop. If God says stop, devil wants you to go. 
That's what spiritual warfare is designed to do is to turn you into a rebel. Okay, and the way he does it is he gets you to doubt God's ways, to doubt God's word, to doubt God's promises, to doubt God's timing. You know, you could be listening to messages of mine and you can hear the devil say, yeah, but that's a Michael. That doesn't apply to you. Yeah, but Michael has ministry. Yeah, but Michael was divorced. Yeah, but Michael got remarried. Yeah, but Michael has a home to live in. Yeah, but Michael has parents. Yeah, but Michael has a trail. You can hear all kinds of thoughts come into your mind that are not coming from God. They're coming from the devil. Many of them come from your own carnal imagination, okay? But the devil will be right there to help. If your mind can't get you across the finish line of failure, the devil will be right there to help you become the chief of all doubters. And that's what you have to stop, okay? Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. How many times in the middle of these battles have I come out and looked up All I did was right now I look up and I see the heavens above me and I know my Father and my Lord and the Holy Spirit who lives in me. They come from this place and my salvation is going to come from this place. Set your minds and hearts on things above and man, all of a sudden I've just had this peace just flood into my heart as I look up. That's putting on the helmet of salvation, remembering no matter what this battle is that's going on in your life, you have been saved by faith, through grace, in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are in him and he is in you, if his words are in you and you're walking, you have the helmet of salvation. You have an inheritance uncorruptible that's being reserved for you in heaven. Man, oh man, does that not brighten up your day when you're in the battle. If you can just think, okay, if everything in my life fails, if devil takes it all, if God allows it all to be ruined and spoiled, and none of my dreams come to pass, I'm going to get to be with him forever in heaven. I'm going to be saved from my sins. My friend, that is taking up the helmet of salvation and you do it intentionally and you do it by faith. Verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers. My friend, praying in the spirit does not mean speaking in tongues. It does not mean what these charismatic nonsense teachings will tell you. Praying in the capital S spirit does not mean praying in tongues any more than walking in the spirit means walking like a chicken. When Galatians 5.25 says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. That does not mean that you walk in a way that is not normal. And praying in the spirit does not mean you pray in a way that is not normal. If you have the gift of tongues, God bless you. But check to make sure it's absolutely authentic. Don't let me meet you and hear you speaking in your tongue language and then have you turn around and stumble and fall and fail or find out you love money or you're carrying unforgiveness or you have no power in your life to live like Jesus Christ. Take your tongues, throw them in the toilet where they came from, flush it and let it go. Walking by the Spirit and praying in the Spirit have absolutely nothing to do with the tongues. When Paul says, I pray in my spirit and with my mind, he uses little s, not big s. Big s is Holy Spirit, verse 18. Ephesians 6, verse 18 is big s. I get so frustrated when I hear all this confusion and stories about people speaking in tongues. And I tell you, I believe with the best of teachers, 90 plus percent of every tongue speaking out there is a false, fake counterfeit. You're repeating the same few words over and over. You're just repeating the same stupid gibberish over and over again, thinking that it's a prayer language. You've been given a counterfeit and here's how you can know. You can take this to the bank and cash it. Because you have no power in your life to live the words you read. You have this thing you call a tongue. And this is spiritual warfare against you. And this is why I'm speaking to you about it. You have been deceived. If you have been given one of these false, counterfeit, charismatic, nonsense, gibberish, banging tongues in your mouth, you should spit it out as fast as you can. You should repent. I'm telling you the truth. If you are not living like Jesus Christ... If you're not living in, unf- uh, in forgiveness of your brothers, if you're not living in love, if you are not getting victory over sin and victory over the world and victory over the flesh and you're going to stand before Christ and babble some gibberish that you learned in your charismatic church, you are going to be among the most embarrassed fools of the day. That is the truth. The Jesus Christ I know gives us power 
to live and walk like Jesus. The evidence that the Spirit of God is holiness, not speaking in tongues. And I will tell you the truth. I would be just as bold as I am on this recording in the face of any assembly of God, charismatic, Pentecostal, you name it, I don't care who it is, put me on a stage with them and bring me 10 of their family members and I'm going to interview them all on the stage and we'll find out if the Spirit of God is really, truly, indeed behind that tongue that's in their mouth. This nonsense of the devil's counterfeit has to be thrown into the garbage. Okay, you talk about spiritual warfare at a whole nother level. Go listen to part one, point number six. That's where I talked about one of the reasons why God is pleased to allow to use the devil is to deceive you permanently because you do not love the truth. I say this in fairness to my brothers and sisters who may indeed have a legitimate language, not a reproducing of three or four words, but an actual language as it was in Pentecost, as it is and will be until Jesus Christ returns. If you have it, God bless you. I do not have the gift of tongues. I've asked the Lord to give me anything he saw fit, but the Bible says it's better to seek for prophecy, and that's indeed what I'm doing to you now. I exercise the gift of prophecy God has given me. In all these recordings... This is the Spirit of God working. I don't have any kind of, you know, assistance or aids or anything like that. It's the Spirit of God ministering the gift of prophecy, which Paul says, do all speak in tongues? Do all prophesy? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And prophecy is greater because it edifies the body of Christ. Okay? Tongues is a very much lesser gift today. And the reason is, is because it leads so many people astray. They think, I am telling you, let me make this final point very clear for anybody who's feeling angry that I'm speaking this. If you speak in tongues and you're feeling angry about me saying this to you right now, you send me an email about tongues and you let me ask you a couple of very probing questions and I will help you with God's grace if God's given you eyes to see for you to really validate whether or not what you call tongues is a true gift from God or have you received a counterfeit siento? a counterfeit $100 bill that you thought for sure would cash at the bank because it looked and sounded exactly like something that was real, but you get there and find out you have been had. You can examine your faith and I can help you. I can help you with scripture, not Michael Criswell. I can help you with scripture to examine and know if what you think you have as tongues is truly a gift from the Holy Spirit or have you picked up a charismatic counterfeit? You would be shocked if I told you stories of tongue speakers I know from around the world that I've heard their stories. Their lives are an absolute wreck in their heart. Their lives are an absolute wreck. There is always something missing in their life. They do not have power. They have a lamp like the five virgins 10 virgins, they all had lamps. That's the word of God. Your word is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. Only five of them were wise enough to buy oil. The oil is the Holy Spirit. When you think you have been given power from God to speak in a tongue, and yet you cannot have power from God to overcome your sin, to overcome your tongue against other people, to overcome your anger, to overcome your love of the world, to overcome your false teaching, to overcome your need to please other people, to overcome your fear of man. But yet you're going to tell me you have this gift. I'm going to tell you, you got hogwash. And any person who loved you enough to tell you the truth would tell you that. That is the absolute truth. If you hear me prophesying, you hear me speaking with such eloquence and wisdom, and if I do not have love, and if I do not have victory over the world, and if... And if I do not have victory over my own flesh, then I have what I have is nothing. There are those who claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. Scoffers of the last days, men who follow mere instinct and who do not have the spirit. There is a counterfeit spirit we are to test. You know you have the real Holy Spirit when your life is holy. When you start feeling lonely in this world around other Christians, 
When you find it hard, let me tell you something, my friend. When you find it hard to find other people who know God and love God and obey God like you do, then you know you have the Holy Spirit. That's the days we're living in. When you feel isolated, when you feel made fun of by other people because you're taking the word of God seriously and other, quote, Christians are making fun of you or picking you apart, then you know you have the Holy Spirit, not when you're speaking in some gibberish or in any gift. I didn't mean for this to become so much about tongue speaking, but I tell you, I flip over change tables in my heart with all of the ignorance over this one subject and how many people the devil leads astray and you see them all over YouTube blabbing up this thing and you go listen to it. I tell you, I know their lives because they divulge it to me. They divulge it to me and they have been ensnared They are in a prison. They are held prison and captive. They are being oppressed. The evidence of their heart is their heart shows they're under a curse. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, a curse beyond all those who do not love God. You can see it in a person's heart and in their life. You shall know a tree by its fruit. My friend, spiritual attack is not evidence that you have bad fruit. The evidence of the fruit is what the spiritual attack produces in your heart. When you're having huge bad week and all these things are happening to you, okay? One bad thing after another and you think, oh, I gotta fight the devil. He's really attacking me. And you don't recognize that it's discipline. You're in trouble, my friend. You're deceived. When you think that everything's about just overcoming the devil and shutting in the mouth of the, the de- demons and, and, and taking them captive and binding them to the pit and doing all these things, my friend, you are deceived. You are absolutely deceived. Ask God to show it to you and he will. If you love the truth, God will make it known to you. The fruit is produced in the heart. If you have a gentleman standing right beside me who's a false believer, who speaks in tongues, and we both come under the same spiritual attack, what you will see is a completely different fruit that comes out of the heart. Usually within an hour to two hours, Michael Criswell will be praising the Father for the attack, praising the Father for the spiritual warfare. This guy over here will be whining and moaning and complaining. That devil, oh, he's trying to take everything from me. That devil, this is spiritual immaturity. This is kindergarten level faith. That devil, he's after me. He's taking all my stuff. I'm going to fight him. I'm going to bind him and his demons. I need to call all the church, get everybody. Immature. I can't believe the devil's doing this. Why won't God help me? Immature, false faith. False faith. How do you know? What does the circumstance or the warfare produce in your heart, my friend? When spiritual warfare comes at me or it comes at Persis, it hurts us. But let me tell you what it produces in our heart. It produces the humility to go to Abba. It produces the thankfulness, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It produces a recognition of the truth of what is it it that we need to be disciplined by. Don't think if you... uh, I had a a personal example I can think of where a person I knew experienced just a terrible week and all things financial was just being hit one thing after another in this one week and this person just kept saying about how, oh, Satan, he's coming, he's attacking us, but we're fighting, we're not gonna let him win and what I was able to see is that this person is under, is being disciplined and they think that they're fighting against the devil who just is out there, you know, just being a mean dog trying to steal everything they have when the truth is God is trying to loosen their grip and discipline them on some things. You see, this is that charismatic madness that takes over and leads you astray. And you can know what I'm telling you is true by looking at your heart. Don't tell me about tongue speaking. One time I'm praying with this guy, he's going through a terrible divorce. I mean, just a horrible divorce. And the guy looked like a wet noodle. You couldn't tell he was a Christian from two feet away, much less, you know, a mile away. He was just a wet noodle. And some, some men asked me to pray for the guy because I went through a terrible, bad divorce. This guy was just being eaten alive. And so I agreed to pray for him. And as soon as I started praying for him, here came the tongue speaking. Like this is, he was obligated to speak in this tongue. And I, it was all I could do 
to not stop and say, hey, let me ask you a question, man. You believe this is from the power of God, right? Like a gift you've been anointed. That This isn't something you learned how to do, picked up third party, came from a foul spirit, uh, watched uh, Sid Roth and, uh, on television and he taught you how to do it. No, you believe this is real, right? Power from God, right? Oh yeah. Where is the power of God for those legs that you're standing on right now? Where is the power of God for the courage? Where is the power of God to believe? Where is the power of God for forgiveness? Where is the power of God to say, thank you, God. Maybe you're removing a child of the devil out of my life through this divorce. And instead of this, this coward, wet noodle thing that you're, you got going here, where is the power? Oh, it just struck me as so ironic. This guy was manifesting what he believes is supernatural power from God And yet in his very legs he's standing on, he has zero, none. What's more important to God, living the active faith and principles of God or manifesting noise that comes out of your mouth? What good does it do for you if you have a legitimate prayer language, but you don't have the power and grace of God to live and walk like Jesus? It does you nothing. Paul says, if you have all the wisdom If you have all supernatural power, basically he's saying if you have everything, but you don't have love, love for God, which is to obey his commands, love for others, which is to give yourself up for them when you need to, when God places a neighbor in your path, then you have nothing. And that's what I want to encourage you again. Again, I I did not realize this would be about tongues, but we'll trust the Lord for this one. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert always and keep on praying for all the saints, okay? That brings me to step three. Step three is pray. You have to pray in spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle. You can't fix it with your hands or with circumstances or by running to natural man. You fix it through prayer. James 5, 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Psalm 62, five through eight. Hold on to this verse. Great passage of scripture. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. And watch this. Verse eight, trust in him at all times. How many times? Right now. Trust in him at all times. How many times? In just a few more minutes after right now. All times. For God is our refuge. James 4, 7 through 10. God tells us to submit ourselves to him. Submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Go meditate on that passage. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is how you win. The spiritual battle is to run to the shadow of the Almighty. You dwell in Him through humility and faith, patience, waiting, obedience to His Word. 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 through 3. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Number four. Close any open doors. I cannot tell you how many emails I receive from people where they have some sort of an open door, unforgiveness for themselves or for others. They've been involved in the occult. They've had uh, palm readings or astrology stuff, psychics, mediums, seances, all of that garbage. That's all from the devil. And it's an open door to spiritual warfare. Get it rid and <sighs> apologize to the Father for any and all of that stuff in your life and repent and get it out. Unbelief. It's impossible to please God without faith. If you don't believe him, you've you've got an open door to attack. You have to believe that Father knows everything that's happening in your life and in your heart and that he indeed is available to help, wants to help, and will help. All right, I'm going down the dangerous part of the trail here. I got to keep my Eyes alert. One second here. Okay, Hebrews 4.14. This is going to be point number five. Take up the shield of faith and hold firmly to it. We talked about it in Ephesians 6.16, but Hebrews 4.14 is another scripture that God would show me all the time. And it says, since 
let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, but it says, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. You have to hold firmly to it. That's why you can see this nonsense of you say a prayer and you're in is garbage. You have to hold firmly to the faith you profess and your faith has to have evidence under your feet that you believe what you say you believe. If you have faith in Christ and you believe in him, that means you believe in his words and there's an awful lot of doing involved in his words. So keep that in mind. Also, I want to recommend to you that you read the Psalms. I read the Psalms over and over and over. It gave me such comfort to see how much the psalmists were going through spiritual warfare wise. I'd read the book of Job regularly and then also Lamentations um, chapter three is an incredible passage of scripture to encourage you when you are being crushed. You got to grab a hold of those things, okay? Number six, persevere. If you don't have this, you can do everything else right and still not make it. You have to be willing to endure. You have to be willing to persevere. A scripture God would show me all the time was James 5.11. Okay, James 5, 10 through 11. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Oh, my friend, look at my life, Brother Michael, as an example. You've heard the recordings of my pain. I've tried to paint as colorful of a picture for you with as many details as I could so far of what it looked like, how real it was, okay? how painful it was, how scary it was. And I've also testified to you about my holding on to God as he holds on to me. And I'm telling you, my friend, just like Job, I have found that the Lord is full of mercy and compassion. And my life has ended up a double blessing, just like Job's, of spiritual prosperity. Praise God, he didn't give me the material prosperity. I don't want that. You can't take it with you anyhow. I got what's much, much better the Levite inheritance, the Lord himself is their inheritance, the spiritual blessings that get to go with us to heaven that actually put you in a position where you don't even desire the material things. It's like Persis said, yeah, in the old covenant, God would give you all these external things, but it was just to scratch the itch. They still had the itch. They weren't filled with the spirit of God. They still didn't have great contentment. They could avoid obvious evil, evils and um obey most of the laws, but when they obeyed, God would give them some nice things, kids, fruitful womb, land, protection from enemies, you know, riches, lambs, all that, farmland, but it was all just to scratch the itch, and God can actually remove the itch and give you such unbelievable fulfillment and peace and happiness. This is why I'm testifying to you about all these things so that you will believe James 5.11 came true in my life and I'm a nobody. The Bible teaches no favoritism with God, okay? No favoritism with God towards people that start. He does favor those who fear him and those obey him. But to start out with, we all start with no such thing as favorites, okay? Hebrews 10.35-39, another great one. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when, meaning after, you have done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. My friend, the thing you want him to promise you is not a spouse, not money, not your kids back, not your marriage back. You think you want those things. In the end, those things rarely help you to become more like Jesus. What you want him to promise you is himself, life to the full, and rivers of living water flowing within you. Then whatever he adds on top of that, you'll always hold it loosely. It will mean very little to you whether he lets you have it or takes it away from you. You'll be free and you'll live detached from all the things that you once needed that were so important to you that you can't take with you when you leave. And that honestly are going to cause you all kinds of problems even when you have them if you don't have fullness in Christ. You'll be topsy-turvy and your happiness will be constantly determined 
by your circumstances. What a prison. What an absolute prison I lived in for all those years. So you need to persevere, okay? For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. My friend, you have to believe. Spiritual warfare wants you to shrink back. That's why you have to do all these principles. Go back and take notes, okay? Um, Number seven, give thanks and praise. This is an absolute atom bomb in spiritual warfare this is like setting off a nuclear bomb in in satan's spiritual camp okay first thessalonians 5 16 through 18 be joyful always you say mike how can you be joyful always i understand but you can be you can be joyful joy and happiness are different things happiness is largely external and it's largely determined by good circumstances joy has nothing to do with what a reflection of the outside of you looks like has everything to do with the internal sense of well-being and hope that all will eventually be well with your soul through jesus christ under no circumstances is this any different circumstances are void as it relates to being able to take away your joy okay you may have some bumpy roads missed happiness but be joyful always look at this pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus how many circumstances all circumstances give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus You can do this in spite of what you feel by faith and with a desire to obey. You won't feel the desire to give thanks. Many times I'm like, oh Lord, what can I even thank you for? But you find something to thank God for and it will begin to lighten your heart. There are all kinds of things. Your salvation, your birth, the person who told you about Jesus Christ, the Bible that you hold in your hands that just 500 years ago, nobody could hold in their hands. On and on and on and on. This very message, YouTube, the ability to go out and hear all kinds of good messages, to have an unbelievable amount of spiritual bread brought right to your door, okay? There's all kinds of things to be thankful for. What God has already done, what he will do. So you can give thanks by faith, and I'm telling you, wow. How many times have I come out here not feeling well, feeling down, and I just began to praise him and thank him. I began to give him the faith that said, Lord, you're in complete control of all of this. I recognize it's all for good. I recognize you're loving. I'm going to trust you in these things. I thank you that you're in control. I thank you, and I just pray scriptures to him. And man, the flood of gratitude comes into your heart. Okay, it doesn't work every single time. You don't want to have, God doesn't want to give you some system You know, to where you operate on a system apart from him. It's the living, breathing relationship with God. But these are principles that he honors when you honor them from your heart. Remember, you're honoring the principle from your heart. You have to have that true desire to love and please him. Let me wrap this up. I'm almost done. Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A few other principles, don't panic. Don't panic. Far worse things have happened to far better people, okay? Don't panic. It's not, you shouldn't be surprised by this. God is completely in control and this is all completely normal. He controls all of your comfort and all your spiritual warfare. Psalm 115.3, God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Psalm 135, 6, the Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth and in the seas and all their depths. Proverbs 16, 4, he works out everything for his own ends, even the wicked, for a day of disaster. Ephesians 1, 11, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. You have to believe this. He's working out everything in your life in conformity with the purpose of his will. So let him do it, okay? Cling to God's word. 
cling to God's word. Find these scriptures that I've shared with you. Find more. Pull them out of the scripture. Put them on your phone. Put them on your bedroom mirror. If you came to our house, you'd see uh, post-it notes with scripture all over. I relied heavily on them. I've left many of them still there. Cling to God's word. Number three, be busy doing good where you can. This is another principle I saw in Genesis 4, 7. God says to Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. What I saw there is a principle, God saying, if you're busy doing good, sin won't have time to master you. So you may feel like you can't do any good. Can you open up a door for the person entering the restaurant in front of you? Can you let that person who's sitting there waiting to pull out, out? Can you smile at the person behind the cash register? Can you tell them that they've done a good job, that you've appreciated? Can you do some small little good when the young lady hands you your coffee at Dunkin' Donuts and she's got a smile on her face? And, and you feel it. Can you say, hey, thank you for that great smile. Can you get busy doing something good? Okay? And it leaves a whole lot less time for the devil to harass you and attack you and kick you while you're down. Finally, uh, or actually Romans 12, 21 also, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You'd be surprised what fires you can put out by simply doing good responding exact opposite to circumstances the way you feel. Somebody says something harsh, you want to say something harsh back? Instead, catch your breath, go pray, come back and find some way to say something nice to them when it's appropriate, not hypocritically. Finally, the conclusion of the matter. I say 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Watch this. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. How are you shielded? How are you protected in the spiritual battle? Through faith. You see the message? Through faith, you are shielded by God's power. 1 John 5, 18 says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. He may be able to inflict some temporary damage that God saw as good, but he cannot harm you as to remove you from God's plan God's purpose or God's blessings in your life if you will proceed in faith. Finally, 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. My friend, do you believe it? If you don't believe it today from your own self or from your own experience, believe your brother Michael when I tell you He can and will rescue you from every evil attack. Give him a chance to develop a track record of faithfulness in your life by giving him your steadfast faith and live godly before him. Okay? And always remember the final principle, Matthew 9, 29, wraps it all up for us here. Jesus said, do you believe I can do this? They said, yes, Lord, we believe. And he says, it will be to you according to your faith. My friend, it is to me according to my faith. It is to Persis according to her faith. It is to you according to your faith. May God help you as you trust Him. May He give you the grace abounding to you in every good work and every good thing so that you can indeed live more like Jesus Christ so that you too can one day read those words of Paul. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus and not just say it, for believing it in the future, but saying it as your real treasured experience now. God bless you, my friend. Hi, this is Michael. Before we continue with part three of this message that I filmed up on the mountain about how to win this battle in spiritual warfare, 
I want you to be encouraged even more. I want you to see how real the principles are that I'm speaking to you about in God's Word. And I want you to know that I'm still practicing what I preach. These things I'm sharing with you are not things that I used to do years ago. These are things that with God's help, I continue to walk in um, as needed as I continue to walk and face a battle. And the devil has provided another wonderful opportunity to show how real he is and to show his hand that shortly after I made this recording, the devil was pleased and God again was pleased to allow him to come in and attack me. And it was not through a person, it was through a spiritual fog, a real heaviness. This is probably one of the most transparent series of recordings and most dangerous recordings I've made to the kingdom of hell and to the kingdom of Satan. Uh, without a doubt. And so in response to that, naturally he attacks me. And so what's interesting is, is you're going to hear me even mention, that's a bit prophetic, you'll hear me mention the possibility of devil attacking me even today in this message. Take a listen to this clip. When you're at peace 10 years ago, or even 10 years ago, or five years ago. And I just want you to see that these principles work. You know, the devil was trying to really discourage me and send some flaming arrows of doubt into my mind about even sharing these messages uh, to try to stop me from sharing this with you. And that's what I want you to know. This is valuable stuff in the kingdom of God. This is really helpful spiritual bread, and the devil has put his signature on it. You see, behind the scenes, I made a pact against the devil years ago. When he destroyed my life, I said, that's okay. You can destroy my life with God's permission, but I'm going to rat you out. I'm going to tell everybody what you did, and I'm going to tell them exactly how you did it, you lying, thieving, cheating, stealing, killing, murderer, father of all lies. I told the devil that. I'm not afraid of the devil anymore. I used to be. Now I know the devil and all of his angels in hell can't do anything to me that father won't allow. That is the truth. And anything that they're able to do to touch me only serves to make me more like Jesus Christ, to make me more humble, to make me dependent upon Him more. For nearly 48 hours, this funk came upon me, and I began to fight it and fight it just through humbling myself before the Lord and asking Him how important it is, um, the different aspects of it, God's purposes for it. Now I want to show you directly from God's Word how you are to respond. Now, this is not exhaustive. There's much more God's Word says on this, but these are the main points uh, that I found and followed and that you can too, okay? How do we respond? Number one, you have to stay alert. You have to recognize that you're in a battle. I found an an illustration is a soldier who finds himself in war, but the battle has stopped for a short time, and he's walking through a field with his gun down. Maybe the cartridge has been pulled out. And all of a sudden, he's surrounded by enemy fire. And it's too late. He had put his gun down. He was at ease. Stay alert. Recognize that every day is a potential for the devil to come at you. Okay? You do need to stay alert. This is something the Bible commands. Even though God is in charge, you have a responsibility to respond to the truth and to his ways. And... 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10 tells us to be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. How? By standing. Lord Jesus Christ, do not lead me into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Friend, I want you to add that as part of the principle of learning how to have victory in spiritual warfare. Pray daily that the Lord would not lead you into temptation, but deliver you from evil. This is a principle that John Bunyan learned through years of suffering in spiritual warfare. But I want to give praise to God because as I waited patiently and put into practice, my friend, the exact principles that you're getting ready to hear in this message, indeed, within 48 hours, the fog lifted. God was pleased to allow the clouds to part and the sun of the Lord Jesus Christ again began to shine and rise in my heart. 
in fullness. So I share this message with you today with excitement, and I just want you to know it's been approved both in the kingdom of heaven and both here in the kingdom of the devil, that it is a message he does not want you to hear, and it's the words of God he doesn't want you to follow. Listen to this message multiple times and consider taking notes so you can get these principles in your heart and you can begin to walk in them and be patient. It takes time to learn these things. May God bless you as you listen. Okay, from here, let me try to wrap this message up with the actual biblical principles, saving the best for the last, God's words, not mine. I've testified to you about how real spiritual warfare has been in my life. You're always ready for anything that comes, okay? Like, for example, if some terrible thing happened to me today, if the devil wants to be um, uh, coming at me today with anything, my feet are ready fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, within a few hours of me making this recording, a real spiritual oppression settled in upon me. I'm not doing anything to be disobedient. I'm not living in any known sin. I'm not harboring any unforgiveness. I'm not struggling with lusts. I haven't been being disobedient to God. Now, on the contrary, I'm right in the sweet spot. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ of God's will for my life being directed and guided by the Spirit. You'll know this from listening to this message. This came from God and not from me. And then here comes the devil again with an all-out war against me to try to stop me from sharing this recording. And there was just a real spiritual fog that settled in over my heart. It was a weightiness, and I recognized exactly who it was coming from, and what it was. Thanks be to God. I just want you to know that I still live these principles that I'm sharing with you. I still do have spiritual battles. In fact, you'll hear me testify to why I have reason to be even under more attack today than I did 